Good morning. Is this working? So uh, in this presentation, I will briefly introduce you to 30 meter telescope. This is going to be one of the large telescopes which will be operating in the next decade. Unlike some of the discussions which will happen today, this is not a designated survey instrument, but this is an observatory. Observatory means that uh, if you have enough resources and if you can gather enough people, you can run surveys of your interest for generation of people to come. So uh, I will not be covering most of the things uh, which can be done with 30 meter telescope as we think today. If you are interested, you can go to these two references. Uh, this is uh, basically this is a compendium of all science can be done by uh, TMT Science Collaboration itself. So this is published in uh, Chinese Journal, and you can see it in archive. A small version for Indian uh, thing is also written. Indian science cases. This is appeared in Current Science. And most of the things I will be presenting here is from TMT documents. And we also have TMT India project office, which is in Pune, which is in Bangalore. And uh, materials taken from these resources will be presented here. Basically, 30 meter telescope project, it is expected to be operational in 2028. It is a rough number, right? You can think of like late uh, next decade. It will be. And partner of this project, uh, and we have about 10% share in this thing. Uh, several important hardware and software components which, which is required to make this thing are, are built here in India. In fact, literally here in Bangalore, because Bangalore is the sort of a center here. It, this consortium consists of people from uh, Japan, Canada, US, China, India. So this is very interesting. This is one of the projects where uh, you will see that Asians China, India, Japan will have more than 50% share in this, uh, this consortium. Basic structure is like this, and we have uh, something like 30 meter telescope. We can imagine 30 meter means it's like for people who know hockey, you know that one third of hockey ground is the mirror size, right? Because you are talking of big mirrors. There are about 600 mirrors which will be arranged to give you one aperture. There is a secondary mirror, tertiary mirror here, and uh, in the side, whatever you are seeing here is an instrument platform which will host about uh, 10, 10 instruments which are going to be here. So basically, this is the instrument platform. And you have secondary tertiary, which will feed to various instruments. And one is also thinking about feeding simultaneously several instruments. Basic uh, configuration now is 30 meter field aperture. And we are talking about uh, something like uh, important wavelength ranges between 0.3 micron to 28 micron. This 28 micron will be decided how far we can go in the far infrared will be decided by where the telescope will be operating. It will come to in a few minutes. But what will be different from any other ELT or GMT is that we are insisting that it can go up to the UV atmospheric cutoff. It has a lot of interesting implications to what one is going to do. And uh, this, uh, since we are having 30 meter aperture, one of the aim is to have collect a lot of photons and also to resolve images as finer quality as possible, that means this will be operating with adaptive optic system from the very beginning. Okay, there are two possible sites I've identified. One is Monakia, because this is what the initial thing, but there are some issues related to the site, which is more or less settled now, but we have a backup place, which will be in La Palma. The idea is to have this telescope operating in the northern sky compared to two other telescopes which will be operating in the southern sky. So what are the kind of configuration one is talking about? Basically, these are the identified instruments now. Nothing is finalized because we are talking about doing science in over 20 to 30 years. But tentatively, one has identified what kind of instrument should go in. There are 10 identified instruments which will eventually come in with a phase of three years durations, right? What kind of uh, space one is, uh, discovery space one is going to probe? We are going to be spatial resolutions of something like 10 milli arc second to few arc seconds and spatial resolutions, uh, spectral resolutions, which will vary from simple imaging up to some high resolution spectroscopy. And we can clearly see, given this kind of range, one will be able to do exoplanet science, starting from there, studying supermassive black hole in the nearby galaxies up to intergalactic space and high redshift uh, galaxies and uh, ga rich objects. There are three instruments which are identified for first light. That means when telescope comes, these are the three instruments which will be available. Two of them are more or less at the level of finalized, finalizing it. One is still tentative. This is wide field optical spectrometer. Basic idea is to have a spectrometer which will do multi-object spectra of objects in the sky. 
and the wavelength range is given here and one is targeting even though this optimistic thing is there as of now we know that we can do several hundred objects in one go right IR, IRMS is basically a multi slit spectrometer operating in the near IR uh, bands okay and uh, again these configurations are given it will have a low resolution spectrograph so one will be able to do spectroscopy as well as imaging so uh, in IR itself we have a imaging spectrometer which is a simple minded instrument where one will have single object spectroscopy with uh, varied uh, possibilities like uh, you will have higher fuse and uh, flexible resolution modes okay so having done this one thing one can do is to have these all 10 instruments which you are proposing and we can map it to the science cases one can do with with this thing this has been done and purpose of slowing this slide is to show that one is going to go from near infrared far infrared to uv regime and with the resolutions varying from few tens to few tens of thousands in this thing and various science cases are listed since this audience is predominantly uh, cosmology galaxy formation and higher achieved universe i will focus more on what can be done with, uh, with with this thing as we go along and this is just to show that it is a lot of work each instrument is each science case has been identified and we projected the science case to the requirement of instruments and the time scales over which different science can be done okay. so now let's move on and i will focus from remaining time on uh, basically cosmic history first question we want to ask is that what is the epoch and nature of first galaxies when first galaxies actually form having formed the galaxies when they end up reionizing the universe epoch of reionization and sources of reionization and we also want to know galaxies and quasar these are our basically probes of our background universe when they form how they evolve and we also want to find the connection between intergalactic medium which is source of baryons to form these structures and galaxies themselves i'll go in in quick uh, quickly go through these things at let when you are considering redshift less than 3 what do you mean by ionization is basically the the intergalactic space is ionized by some radiation and what is the source of this radiation which keeps this intergalactic space highly ionized when you are dealing with redshift greater than 10 one is talking about what are the sources of reionization which will actually ionize the universe and give the ionized universe which we see okay in particular when we are talking about uh, redshift 10 there are two issues we want to understand what are the sources we, we should identify the sources that is easy to do the second thing is that how efficient these sources are in actually distributing these UV photons outside this galaxy and percolate into the intergalactic space. Okay, one of the problem we always know is that if you look at the emissivity of quasars, we know that they peak around redshift 3 and, and decline very rapidly as you go to higher redshift. Same seems to be the ga uh, case with galaxies. That means definitely when you are going to reionize the universe at higher redshift, one is going to face the problem of deficiency of sources. And in fact, it has been amplified by uh, ongoing observations. One finds that even if you take this trend, if you try to extrapolate, what one finds is that both Lyman break galaxies and Lyman alpha emitters, as you go to higher redshift, the decline seems to be faster than what is shown around redshift 2 to 5. Of course, is it true? Is it a true decline? Or it is an apparent decline because of the way you analyze the, uh, uh, analyze the surveys, right? Of course, we have to remember that all these things we understand is based on spectroscopy, is based on photometric redshifts at higher redshift. We don't have the spectroscopic uh, uh, redshift measurements for large number of objects. So one has to understand it could be, uh, uh, it could be much more spectacular if you, if you know the sense of sources with this. So what you can do with uh, TMT, and this is the plot, this is the prediction. Suppose you, you want to take uh, spectroscopic observations of objects of different sizes, ranging from 50 uh, milli arc second to 400 milli arc second with a PSF of 50 milli arc second per pixel, what kind of uh, sensitivity you can achieve in one hour period. So you can take some typical galaxy, you can take this green curve. If you take one hour exposure, you get signal to noise of about 10 for sources around 26.5 magnitude. If you are flexible enough to give this thing a, a signal to noise of 5, you are actually reaching about 27th magnitude, which means that we are more or less ready. If you go, if you spend several hours, you are more or less ready to get spectra of objects in, in H band magnitude of 28, uh, 28, right, 28 magnitude with the sizes of half arc second or something like that. If you go for point sources, this is the picture. Why do we need to do point sources? This for cosmology, you know that we would like to measure the redshift of supernovae at very far distances or GRBs. And you can clearly see that you can reach the sensitivities in one hour exposure, you can go up to 26th magnitude or something. Even if you say that supernova will be available for 10, 15 minutes, you are talking of something like 24th magnitude, quite easily you can take spectra. And you can see that you can have these Hubble constant measurements 
one can follow it up to up to redshift of five without without much difficulty. So galaxy formation is going to have a huge bump, a huge boom, because you will be able to measure redshifts of large number of objects. Of course, there are questions like whether you have galaxies in Hubble sequence, like whether you have this red red versus blue branch, which people keep studying and keep discussing, clustering depending on color and things like that. Can you see them up to very large redshifts? Important thing is to not only measure these galaxies, you have to also resolve them, and we should be confident enough to say that these, these galaxies have these colors, right? If there is no blending, this is not mixture of galaxies, these are isolated galaxies, which means that high resolution imaging with high sensitivity photometry is, is going to solve, uh, uh, allow you to do this kind of exercise. Of course, given the spectroscopy, you will be able to do the spectral energy distribution of distant galaxies, not only measuring redshifts, because that is the game we, are, we can play now, when you have 30 meter telescope, you want to characterize the galaxies. You can actually get the spectrum, not only measure these breaks, you will also measure these emission lines. So you can quantify ages, stellar masses, metallicities, and things like that, all quantities in, in distant galaxies. Of course, you can, since we have infrared spectroscopy, you will be able to detect things like helium-1, helium-2 lines from the high redshift galaxies. It's important that these lines are only seen in AGNs. If you see them in normal galaxies, it means that these has something like population three stars kind of, right? Only very massive high energy radiations can give you this thing. So one can probe this massive stars, not by models, right? Now we will say that if you want to produce this, we need this, okay? We will directly see them if you do spectroscopy. Of course, I'll skip this. So you will, you will do properties of galaxies we can probe in, 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 in great detail, okay? So this is high redshift galaxies. You will be able to probe the distribution of galaxies and clustering of galaxies in, in, in much better detail, right? Because another thing is that you can measure the sizes of galaxies and you can actually resolve the galaxies at a scale of something like 0.4 kiloparsec scale. That means like you are, you are going to look at galaxies and morphologies. Not only that, if you, if you put them in IFUs, you can also get spectra of these individual patches. That means that no more we are going to talk about uniform one, one value of stellar mass, one value of star formation rate, one value of these things. Actually, you will have the distribution like the way Manga survey is doing for our local galaxies. You will be able to do this for redshift two galaxies with this. Okay. Of course, you will be measuring luminosity functions uh, to much lower uh, luminosities, which is important to understand very different feedback processes, the shape, and is there a cutoff at the low mass end has significant implication to the galaxy formation models and feedbacks which are going to be imprinted on them. Last but not the least, related to this thing, every galaxy is showing huge Lyman alpha emission extending much beyond the virial radius, one has to understand what is the cost for this. Is it an infalling intergalactic matter or it's a matter thrown out by the radio galaxies or something else? So it's a very interesting indication for the feedback process in place. Of course, now that I am in the end, I would like to spend a few minutes on the intergalactic space. You can use large number of background galaxies to study the distribution of matter in the intergalactic medium. So basic idea is that now we can do spectroscopy of 26 magnitude objects you can clearly see that you can do the spectroscopy of galaxies and you can start detecting absorption line produced by intergalactic medium in the spectroscopy of distant galaxies. It has already been demonstrated, there are cases already we know that intergalactic absorption can be picked in the spectra of distant galaxies. If you have large number of galaxies, you measure the absorption occurring at the same redshift, you can invert this problem and actually construct the density field as a function of redshift using the density velocity fields and power spectrum can be extracted. Okay, last few slides, quick. One is known as redshift drift, drift experiments. This experiment is that you look at uh, intergalactic medium, you look at distant quasars, you look at the Lyman alpha forest absorption line. If universe is having constant acceleration or something, these absorption lines should show shift. If you measure over a period of 10 years, something like 3,000 quasar sight lines, no, sorry, 300 quasar sight lines with the signal to noise ratio of 4,000 uh, with a baseline of 10 years, you will be able to distinguish between different models of cosmology, which one is talking about. If somebody is interested, I'll discuss with you later. This is the project one can do. But the demand on the spectroscopy is pretty high. During this period, your spectroscope should be stable. Your wavelength calibration should be stable at the level at which you are going to measure these shifts. But this is going to be one of the experiments uh, persuaded by various people. And especially in Europe, there is a good push to do this experiment. Of course, other things we can do is the direct measurement of cosmic microwave background temperature. This can be done once you detect the CO molecules, and we have detected CO molecules, but the problem in measuring is that we are unable to resolve these rotational levels because these quasars are too faint. 
So once we have this uh, 30 meter telescope, we'll have better resolution to resolve these rotational levels and we'll directly measure the temperature of cosmic microwave background. I think for this audience, you think that it is normal. But if you have not proved that temperature goes like adiabatic expansion, and you may question all your CMB experiments later on. I think this precision is going to be improved dramatically soon. A last part of the things one can do is to do, and I'm, I'm through. Last, last bit of the question is that we know that the last decade, now it is quietened out a bit. Last decade, there was a debate whether the fundamental constants are changing or not. And this question can be addressed very well once we have access to big telescopes, because one of the issues one is facing is that how much is the effect one sees is dominated by systematics and how much is the real signal, one will be able to have this answer to this. Of course, there is a danger in giving a talk on future observatories. I think giving a talk on mission is okay. This is what we discussed this morning. Because you have one name, you say that I want to measure this five parameters at 5% accuracy, either you measure it or not measure it. But giving a talk on an observatory like this is really, I, I must say that it is a foolish thing to do, because we know history says every time a telescope is proposed, people come up with a list of things to do. When the telescope actually goes in the sky, they will do something else. The first nature paper comes on a thing which is not written as a science case there, because that is the beauty of doing classical astronomy. And this is a classical astronomy instrument. Ten years down the line, our idea of cosmology would have changed, but this instrument will be ready to give you whatever you want to do. So that's the way it has been built. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks for giving a lot of space to questions. Questions? It's about this uh, redshift drift experiment. So how feasible is to have a spectrometer which has uh, stable over the period of 10 years that require accuracy. I mean, do we already have spectroscopies which uh, which are, uh, we are close to that and a yeah, yeah, little bit of improvement we the, can get I, there? I think in principle it is possible to have such a spectrograph. But the problem is that this is 30 meter telescope. The already the spectro, uh, high resolution spectrograph will be very big. And to maintain the stability, to keep it in vacuum and all, makes the, uh, the whatever, price of this spectrograph five to six times more. So this is the question. If one can afford to have a spectrograph with laser comb kind of a calibration, plus whole thing is in vacuum, maintained over this thing for a long period of time, it's possible to do. Uh, but uh, you know, like when you start doing, you may find some new things. But it's very expensive. That is what is stopping one from actually building such a spectrograph. Because normal spectrograph can be built in one sixth or one seventh of the price. Whereas to have this high stability, you will end up spending huge amount of time in building the thing. And also, observationally, you have to take calibration data as much as observational data. It means that it's cost in both ways, cost in observing time, because one hour in this thing is several crores, right? So we have to be careful. That's the... Anyway, Espresso is a good precursor of such uh, this yes. class of instruments, and is working in this moment at the combined focus of the four VLTs, so it's not uh, attached to, the, to a telescope, and this helps a lot. So given that uh, TMT is likely to be a few years behind uh, the other giant telescopes, uh, I suppose some of the low-hanging fruits will be done by the other telescopes. So what do you think as the, uh, the science that can only be done with TMT? Uh, I think it is, uh, this is not clear what, is, what do you mean by low-hanging this thing. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, for example, uh, one of the things, because being a spectroscopic, I will, I, I will say is that the focus in ESO is mainly towards adaptive optics. I think their low-hanging fruit seems to be looking at the universe at uh, higher spatial resolution. Uh, and it is also challenging because MOAO, this multi-conjugate multi adaptive optics, is not demonstrated at this scale. So uh, they are going towards infrared with uh, uh, with adaptive optics kind of thing, right? Whereas uh, if uh, if you go with uh, TMT, the first you will just look at the first light instrument. TMT is also preparing for something like a low risk uh, science cases, which is what is our multi-object optical spectrograph. And this spectrograph will work if it goes through like what we have been planning. It will work up to, uh, to uh, atmospheric cutoff. I think as far as I see, this is not going to be available with any other telescope. So first light itself. So doing IGM tomography, for example, uh, TMT will be leading compared to, uh, compared to other things because it will take some time for uh, 
this instrument to come in other telescopes. Whereas, uh, if you have something interesting in uh, planet things, and if it is going to be done with high resolution, maybe TMT is not yet ready for doing that, right? We have no first light instrument for doing planet science. That may be done by ESO, for example. I, I think that there are, there is a space for everybody here. 